the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. Won't that be interesting? The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hands into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. And this is the reason why. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, the root of Jesse, that's Jesus, will stand as a banner for all peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. Bless the word of the Lord. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about... We've all seen this in politics. I talked a little bit about this last week on Isaiah 9, 6, where often as human beings, we, we desire to be delivered from difficult things. That, that's a natural human desire to be delivered from illness, from injury, from death, from oppression, from war, from all kinds of things, slavery, all kinds of stuff, because these things were not designed to be part of our makeup. When we were put in the Garden of Eden, as Adam and Eve, we were not designed for those things. We were designed to live in perfection. But since we sinned and caused sin to come into the earth uh, in that form and, and all everything in creation has come under the fall, now we, we labor under those things. And so often our world gets very tough, right? You watch North Korea, you watch the news, it gets really tough. And so we all, every single one of us, desire a little bit of a deliverer, somebody that's a little bit like a savior to some degree. I think God's put that within us. Often we turn to political figures to do that. We just recently had a, a president elected a year ago and, and all the stuff around that election and, and people on both sides and all those kinds of things. But it made me think about a presidential election that maybe you know about or don't know about that almost happened many, many years ago. There was a man by the name of Huey P. Long that was the elected governor of Louisiana in 1928. And this is coming right through the Great Depression, the beginning of that. Things were very tough. Things were very difficult. And, and it was a very uncertain time, and everybody was kind of looking for a Messiah. And so when he came on the scene, he kind of won the hearts of the people of the state by, by speaking their language, by doing things that nobody else had done. Everywhere he went, he had this huge band that went with him. And he insisted on going the back roads and the highways and the byways and the bayous and the swamps to meet every person he could have. And he would handshake, and he would glad hand, and he would talk, and he would sit on the back porch, and he would chew tobacco, and he would spit, and he'd do all the stuff to be part of the common people, right? Have a beer with a guy, all those things. And people loved him, right? He spoke their language. In fact, during his first campaign, he traveled 15,000 miles over the state of Louisiana. They logged his mileage. Can you believe that? Just an incredible man that got to the people. All those people did not forget him. And, and his campaign banner was, every man is a king, right? In other words, you can be the, you know, the head of your own ship, the captain of your own soul kind of thing. And that was a slogan that he pushed around. And he, he kind of sounds a little bit like a recent president said, share the wealth, right? Everybody's going to have a, a chicken in the pot and a, and a you know, Mercedes Benz in the garage kind of thing, that kind of thing. And he, and he pushed himself against the corrupt politicians. He said, if we can get out from underneath their thumb, underneath big business interests, underneath the newspapers, and all those things, then he could lead the people to prosperity in Louisiana. Well, he was elected by the largest majority ever to be in a governor of Louisiana. And then he ran for the U.S. Senate, became a senator. And before he could go on to run as the U.S. Uh, presidential race when he was 42 he was assassinated so apparently somebody thought he had a good shot at making it and didn't want to see that happen but whenever you read about it it's just kind of a crazy thing that at his funeral they they put his body into the rotunda of the state house in louisiana which is not a very big place if you've ever been there and they had 150,000 people in the rain come out to see his body at his wake a man of the people, a Messiah, a man that would, that would do what nobody else could do. But at the end of the day, when you continue to study his life, he was only human. He still had corruption. I've tried very carefully not to talk about that. He still had sin in his life that became very public later on to historians and those kinds of things. 
In other words, whenever we put our trust in man, whenever we put our trust in the things of this world, inevitably, no matter how good they are, no matter how great they are, they're going to come up short and they're going to fail us. I think as we look in Isaiah 11, you know, we're a little bit like those people in Louisiana. I think as we look at our life now, we are just like King Ahaz. We've been looking at Isaiah, and King Ahaz was going to be assaulted by these two warring powers north of him, north of Judah. And it's, it's about 700 to 750 B.C., and he sees this power coming down, and he doesn't think he can beat them, so he's going to make a pact with the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria is going to turn around and backstab him and betray him. And eventually, Judah's going to fall, Jerusalem's going to fall, in 586 B.C. to the Babylonians who are going to conquer the Assyrians. And so it's just going to all come unraveled. And so Ahaz is looking for this salvation. He's looking for a political solution. He's looking for a man to save him in that day. He, his heart kind of cries out with that voice that we all have. Is, is there anybody out there? Is there someone who cares? Is there someone who's coming to the rescue? Is there someone who can take up my cause and, and turn the tables of what we're involved in? I think that's the voice and the heart of everybody here. Well, in the midst of that, Isaiah in the background has this prophetic message that gives this final answer to these deep heart longings. He says that God will send the Messiah King. And we looked at the character of this king last week in Isaiah 9, 6. The, the mighty God, right? Prince of peace, everlasting father, wonderful counselor. This, this God that's going to come on the scene. Emmanuel, God with us, and his mission is to heal the scars and the wounds of the nations, the broken hearted, to release their prisoners from our own sin, our own making, and to restore everything that's been lost over the years, to, to fill in all the wasting that's gone on. And eventually that will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 11, the prophet's going to hold up snapshots of what will be Jesus' will done on earth as it is in heaven of what the final kingdom's going to look like, of what, of what that's going to feel like. And it gives us a, a feel for those things because we need to understand at Christmas time what kind of king, right? What kind of king are we worshiping tonight and tomorrow? What's the end game of being with Jesus, of following him? What's the end game of following this, this Christ child that the Magi that they worshipped and the shepherds worshipped and the angels worshipped, that Herod tried to eliminate by killing the children as a competitor that eventually was crucified on the cross of what we call Easter. I think that as we look to Isaiah's prophetic message, we get these, these final answers kind of answered as we look at it this week and next week. And so there's a few things I want you to take out of this passage. First is, I think the humble beginnings of life of Jesus Christ and his humanity means that, that he knows what you and I are going through. He is a true God-man of the people. Look at verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That's a formal name. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, probably in your NIV or whatever you have, Jesse's capitalized and branch is capitalized. I mean, it's a formalized name. And it's referring to Jesus Christ. He's the branch that's going to come out of Jesse, right? He's going to be a perfect kingdom ruled by a perfect king. But guess what? Much like Aladdin, this, this perfect king comes from very humble origins. The Jesus that we're going to worship today and tomorrow, the Christ child, he, he's not a God that was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He's not a guy that came down from heaven with a, a flowing robe and gold and purple and the brass ring and people bowing and kissing at his feet. That's not how Jesus came into this world. He comes in as one of us, God with us, Emmanuel, wrapped in human flesh, becoming flesh, one of us, right? And it's hard to see a more bleak picture that Isaiah describes here of a stump, where there was a mighty, beautiful tree once, right? Have you ever seen part of the forest that's been clear-cutted? You know how much I love Grand Mason. I go up there, and if you drive on one of those side roads, I think it's uh, 125, it goes back to a place that's heavily logged. And if you drive back on one of those lakes, you can get around it, and it's like clear-cutted all around it. Now, the good news is they clear-cut dead trees that are already dead from beetle kill. The bad news is it's ugly. Just looks like what? When you see a clear-cut force, what does it look like to you? Desolation, loss, death, 
bleak yuck. That's how it was for Israel in Isaiah's time. He saw the coming armies that were going to take him. He saw the the loom of, of death on the doorstep. And instead of turning to God, King Ahaz turns to man and puts his trust in man, which fails him because his ally becomes his enemy. And Isaiah, looking into the future and the power of the Holy Spirit, says this, this bleak picture of a shoot will come up from what? The stump of Jesse. This is a reference to Isaiah 16 that talks about Jesus, that out of the dead stump will grow a green shoot that will grow up and become more powerful than all the other trees. Jesus Christ is that one person that we can rely upon because he's one of us. He understands what we're going through. How was he born, right? He was born into poverty. He was born into simple lifestyles. He was truly a person of the people. And God did not abandon him, right? He was with him the whole time. And so I think we need to learn to be the opposite of Ahaz. We need to learn and say, instead of we trust in whatever man says, you fill in the blank, we trust in the name of the Lord our God, that we stick with Jesus, right? And so Isaiah sees in the Holy Spirit-inspired prophetic vision this, this life emerging from death and loss and desolation, this small green shoot that will spring forth and become a mighty tree. And so when he says it's from the a stump of Jesse, he's referring to Jesse, King David's father. Now, if it wasn't for King David, would we have any clue who Jesse was? Not the first idea. He's nobody important. He's a simple guy, a run-of-the-mill dude. He didn't do anything great. We don't hear about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Jesse. We don't hear about anything's great. Just his son David becomes great. And that Jesus Christ is a type David is a type of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is in the bloodline of David. But it's interesting here that Isaiah doesn't say the stump of King David. He says the stump of Jesse. Why is that? Why does he point to Jesse? I think there's three reasons why that, that it's emphasized. First is that God loves to magnify his grace in mysterious ways. Right? Jesse's nobody. He's nobody. But from him will come Jesus Christ eventually. He's the umpteenth great-great-grandfather of Jesus Christ. And God uses simple things for great things. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27-29, that he's chosen the weak things in this world to shame the strong. Jesus is big on using things that cannot possibly get it done. If you think someone can't get it done, God's going to use him. King David was a little ruddy, little handsome, wiry little dude that watched sheep. And God's spirit comes upon him, that's the key, and drops mighty Goliath, was probably nine feet tall. Now, how many of you have seen Star Wars recently? The Last Jedi, right? Chewbacca? That actor is seven foot two. Now, think about a, a giant, a couple feet, maybe three feet, two feet higher than him, and twice as big, a big mountain of muscle. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David, and with those simple stones, he drops Goliath. And see, it's just something simple. David's a simple boy from a simple man, Jesse, and God, he loves to use the weak things of this world, right? He loves to magnify his grace in mysterious ways to the weak, and so it will come from Jesse. Second of all, you know, the Messiah, like we said, was not born in privilege, but he's born into obscurity and poverty. It's hard to imagine worse conditions. My father was born in 1931 in a sod house in a 1880s fort that doesn't exist anymore in South Dakota on the way back from sharecropping during the Great Depression, my grandparents. I thought that was pretty bad. But Jesus has that licked. Okay, he's born into a no name, no place, backwoods watering hole named Bethlehem. And that's not just that. He's not born into anything significant there. He's born into what? A stable. When Jesus was born, when he comes forth from Mother Mary, the only thing he has to to welcome is his mom and dad, the angels, and what? Animals. The animals that he created. You talk about being poor. Dude doesn't even have a crib. He doesn't have a pop-up Grocco. He doesn't have any of that. He has to lay in the food trough, right? 
This is a big deal. These guys were broke. I mean broke, broke. I mean broker than broke. And God uses simple, rather ordinary beginnings to bring forth the great Messiah. And we also talked about that the Messiah was going to be another David, right? But he's going to be much greater. He's from the root of Jesse. But guess what? He's going to be in the power and the vein of King David who had the united kingdom of Israel, all God's people together. And he was what? The scripture says in multiple places. What was David like? He was a man after God's own heart. That's how Jesus is going to be. He's going to be the God man that is truly 100% sold out after God's own heart. John 5, 20 says, John 5, 30, I mean, says that Jesus says, I've come to do the will of the Father and do what pleases him. It was very simple for Jesus. His resume was very simple. I do what the Father says. And I have one mission and one mission only. And that is to save all mankind from their sin. It's very interesting to watch how Jesus does things like heal people and fix things and, and talk to crowds and wow them and all that. And in the midst of the high points of his ministry, what do you often see Jesus do? Walks away. Gets on the boat, gets out on the lake to get away from him. Goes up on the mountaintop, gets away from him. Do what? Every single one of those times, what's he doing? He gets alone with the Father. It was more powerful for him to draw strength from the Father than to just do 24-7 ministry. He understood who he was as the Christ child of Christmas. He knew what his mission was, which was to seek and to save the lost. A stump will come up from this, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch, a branch will do what? Will bear much fruit. Jesus Christ, as we're going to see in verse 10, is going to be that branch that's going to bring in the nations, people from all over the world that will be saved and come into the new heaven and the new earth. The second thing I want you to see is that the king of Christmas reigns in his kingdom with unlimited power for you and I. He's not only one of us that understands what we're going through. He lived just like us. In fact, the scripture says he was tempted in every way, right? He was one of us. He understood temptation. And so he's a good high priest, the book of Hebrews says, that can sympathize with our weaknesses. But it goes on to say that, that the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, verse 2, right? That seems like a small thing, but that's not a small thing. That is a huge thing. Because whenever... Something great happens in the biblical holy text. In the Old Testament, it's the Spirit of the Lord comes upon. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon. The Spirit of the Lord engulfs. The Spirit of the Lord covers. The Spirit of the Lord rests upon. The Spirit of the Lord fills or comes upon an individual. And it characterizes this branch as being what? That the Spirit of the Lord will what? Will rest on him. Won't come on him. Won't sit on him won't engulf him, won't cover him, but will rest upon him. It's a permanent state because it's the Spirit of God. And he is God. He has unlimited power for you and I. What kind of spirit of, of, rest, of the Lord will rest upon him? The spirit of what? Of wisdom and understanding. A spirit of counsel and of what? Might. A spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, right? you got these pairs here, these three separate pairs, and they go together on purpose. Because with wisdom comes what? Understanding. With good counsel comes power to do something about it. And knowledge and the fear of the Lord go together, right? And then what does it say at the end of it? It says that he will delight, verse 3, in the fear of the Lord. The heart of Jesus Christ was the Father's will and the Father's agenda all the time. He loved the Father. He delighted in the Father. He desired to be with the Father. And he feared the Father. In a healthy way. He enjoyed a deep relationship, right? So no matter how humble the origins or beginnings of this eternal king, he has the fullness of the Spirit of God upon him, filling him like no one ever since. Now you say, we talk about Christmas. You say, what does Christ in Christmas mean? Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. And when it says the Holy Spirit comes upon him and rests upon him, what does it mean to be a Christ or a Messiah? It means literally translated the anointed one, capital A, capital O, a very special individual. And how are they anointed? They are anointed with God's Spirit. They're one individual like that, Jesus Christ alone. None of the rest of us are like that. 
the anointed one of Israel, the Holy One, the Christ child, the Messiah, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. And so when he's one of the people like us, he also has power that's unlimited to help us, right? He was perfect. He never sinned. Thus, God's Spirit fully engages and utilizes him to build God's kingdom upon the earth. When Jesus went to heal somebody, was there ever somebody that he could not heal? Do we ever see that in the biblical text? Everybody that he desired to heal, he healed. Now, sometimes their faith and trust in him meant that he didn't choose to heal them because they didn't trust him. But if he wanted to heal them, he healed them. Did he raise people from the dead? Jairus' daughter, right? Raised himself from the dead. He had the power over sin and death, right? All these different things. This God, this, this man from Galilee had the power to raise the dead, heal the sick, overcome sin, sickness, death, the grave, and he has perfect understanding of our needs because he was one of us that lived among us. Now you combine that, someone that truly is one of us and understands us, and has unlimited power of the Holy Spirit together. And then that person is our advocate, the one who's looking after us. That's a powerful thing to have in your life. And so at this Christmas Eve, I want to ask you the question is, who's in your corner? Who's in your corner? Because we want to have Jesus in our corner, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that spirit-empowered. We want to have him in our, in our corner. Because the scriptures say that the Lord is my shepherd and what? I shall not want. Psalms 23.1. When God's in our corner, he meets all our needs. It doesn't mean that we don't have needs. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle. It doesn't mean that we don't have difficulties. But he meets those needs in supernatural ways with his grace. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 38.4 or 34.8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Taste and see. Come to God, try him out, see what he'll do. He is good. The power of the Lord is, the Spirit is upon him, right? I, when I came in earlier this morning, one of our singers, she said, down in Texas, we say, y'all, right? And they got all these signs out there that says, God is good, y'all. That would be the modern expression of this. God is good. The Spirit of the Lord rests upon him, and he's in our corner. He's the one that's with us, right? How can you possibly walk through this life well without Jesus. How do you do that? I don't know what that looks like. In my own life, I've lost all my grandparents, both my parents to serious illness, a brother took his life, okay? A number of other people had a difficult pregnancy that was supposed to be born. She's up there running all the sound and stuff now, not sound, but the, the pictures, Broke my back, a variety of things. And I can't imagine going through all those things in my life without Jesus Christ in my corner. How do people do it without Jesus? It is so much better. It's so much sweeter with the goodness of the Lord in our corner. No matter what you're doing with the difficulties of this life under the sun, as Solomon called it, having Jesus in your corner is about his time, his love, his support, his care, and him helping you with unlimited power with the Holy Spirit that rests upon him. We walk by faith, not by sight, according to 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So I think we need to trust in the Christ of Christmas with our whole lives. He rescued Israel, he redeemed the lost years, and he'll do the same for us. Next, I think the king of Christmas reigns in his kingdom with perfect justice. Verses 3 through 5. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he'll give decisions to the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. And righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. What will his kingdom be like? Isaiah describes what the new heaven and the new earth is going to look like. The Christ child that comes at Christmas comes as one of us to live among us, to show us how to live for the Father and to provide the only means to the Father through his atoning death on the cross. But the Christ child that will come as the conquering king the second time, that will be different. He will institute the new heaven and the new earth and it will look totally different. He will judge, not with his eyes or with his ears, right? But how will he judge? He will judge as the Father tells him. 
The Father is perfect, and as the Father tells him, he will judge not by what he sees or what he hears, right? And this is an idea that a judge only gets to take in what they see and what they hear in a courtroom, and they're limited by that. And in the ancient world, the kings were like a judge, and people would come before them and plead their case, and they got to see and they got to hear, and that's all that they knew was what was presented, much like a courtroom today. And sometimes you make a good judgment and sometimes you make a bad judgment, but you're limited by the data that you have. Guess what? There's no limitations to Jesus Christ's knowledge, amen? He sees the past, present, and future, all possibilities at the same time as if they were concurrently happening, and he knows exactly what you're going to choose. He will judge with righteousness, right, and with justice. And why does it say he will judge for the needy and the poor of the earth? In the courtrooms across the world, the United States is one of the best in the world, maybe the best probably, but around the world, if you've traveled to different nations, especially other third world nations or developing nations, who gets the short end of the stick in the courtroom? The poor. The wealthy pay their way off. They pay off the the magistrates and the judges. But the weak, the downtrodden, the poor, they get the short end of the stick. But Jesus Christ doesn't allow that. He is the advocate of the poor. He is the advocate of the needy. He is there for those who are hurting. He is the good shepherd, right? And righteousness will be his belt. And what's that last verse say? And faithfulness, a sash around his waist. Man, what will the kingdom be like? He'll do the will of the Father. We looked at that in John 5.30. But righteousness and faithfulness, faithful to who? Faithful to the Father, who he sits at at the right hand of heaven. Faithful to who? Faithful to you and me, right? Hebrews 13.5, never, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Isn't that a great promise? Then no matter what we go through, no matter what we do, no matter how we fail Jesus, his grace will overcome that, and he is faithful to us. And he's faithful to seeing God's will all the way to the end of the line. Faithful and true. We looked at that last week when we looked at him coming as the conquering warrior king on the great white horse of Revelation 19. And on his thigh is written his name, faithful and true. He is faithful to you and I. Psalms 55, 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And who's mentioned specifically? The needy, the poor, people like you and I. And you say, what are you talking about? I don't know if I fit in that category. Scripture says that you and I are needy and poor. Every single one of us, of which I'm chief, are sinners. And we are all needy of Jesus' righteousness. And we are all poor in spirit. But that's a good place to be, right? What's the beatitude say about the poor in spirit? Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? God's got us. He's in our corner. He's got our backs. This this righteous ruling ruler, king, and judge, that this Christmas, I pray that you'll hang your hopes and your dreams on him. Because at the end of the day, when he comes back, there is a judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says it's destined for man to do what? To die one time and after that to face judgment. Each of us individually will stand before a righteous judge. This isn't preaching hellfire and death. This is just preaching what the scripture says. That Jesus gives us all the opportunity in the world to have a personal relationship with his son. And that's what it's about. Not religion. It's about relationship at Christmas time. Being close to Jesus. Experiencing his love, his goodness, his grace. But if we don't want to participate in that, then we have to stand before him as a righteous judge. I pray that this Christmas you will choose Jesus Christ so that when you stand before the judge, he will see his son Jesus, right? Amen? We'll be covered by the blood of the lamb. Those of us who know Christ in that personal relationship are covered by Christ. He's paid the penalty already, and we are good with God. We're made right. That's what we need to be. I pray that you pin your hopes and dreams this Christmas upon Jesus Christ. Book of Hebrews says, as you continue on after 27, it says, So Christ was sacrificed once for the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. You guys know that song that we have to sing here at Cornerstone? 
cornerstone, Christ alone, weak made strong. That's us in Christ. When you put yourself in Jesus, man, the spirit of the Lord is resting upon him. He delights in the fear of the Lord and he will judge righteously. And he has righteousness and faithfulness that are part of who he is. Finally, I want you to see this. The perfect king of kings will rule the new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem, by giving us a new kind of Eden. Verses 6 through 10. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will die down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling will be together, and a little child will lead them. As you go on, it talks about the cow and the bear and all these things and the, and the child with the, with the viper and all those things. And, and you look at this and you say, what is Isaiah's vision talking about? When the Christ child comes and he's been lived among us, Emmanuel, one of us, God with us, God becomes flesh and dwells among us, John 1.14. And he lives a perfect life and he goes to the cross and he dies in your place and mine as our substitute. And he takes all of my sin and yours, and he gives us all of his perfection and righteousness to those who trust and accept that. He's buried for three days. He rises from the dead. He spends four days among us. And when I say he rises, I mean he rises bodily in the flesh like me and you. Okay, he eats fish. He hangs out with people. Thomas puts his fingers in the holes in his hands and his side. It was his real self, risen from the dead. And it says that he ascends into heaven, but when he comes back and he institutes everything, he will rule from Mount Zion, from Jerusalem. It will become a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth. I'll be honest with you, I understand all that, but the scripture says in the book of Revelation that it creates a new heaven, a new earth, and the new heaven descends upon the new earth, and all that comes together, and to be frank with you, my mind's not big enough to understand all that. And forgive me, but yours isn't either. At the end of the day, what will that look like? Does this sound like the earth that you live in? The wolf lies down with the lamb? Man, that's a totally different idea of lamb chops altogether, <laughs> right? The wolf's chops next to the lamb's chops, but not eating him, right? The child is hanging out with the lion and the calf and the yearling? Come on. This doesn't sound like the world that I live in. Children playing with a cobra, sticking their hands in the viper's nest? That doesn't sound like anything I've prescribed to my kids. Quite the opposite. Snakes will be good. Is that possible? Kim, is that possible? Snakes will be good? In the new heaven and the new earth, everything will be right because of verse 9. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. When Jesus is in charge, when the King of kings and Lord of lords comes back to rule the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, he will make everything right. It's a picture of what we talked about last week, shalom. Everything's perfect. Everything's right. Everything's just. Everything's peaceful. Can you imagine what it looks like? Now, that doesn't mean we're sitting around playing with strings, in a diaper, with wings, floating along, singing to Jesus. That's nonsense. Where do you find that in scriptures? And if it's true, I'm going to need a big diaper. It's not good. Okay? So nobody wants to see me in that. Okay? So... So we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth, a new city, a new Eden. It's going to be us doing all these things. And if you're good at something now, you may be even better at it then. You like to build? You're going to get to build, maybe. You like to sing? You're going to get to sing. You like sports and athleticism? You may get to do those things. It's an amazing thing. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who, what, love him. That's the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, right? And in that day, verse 10, the root of Jesse, who's that talking about? Jesus Christ, back to verse 1, right? Will stand as a what? A banner for all people. What does a banner do to an army? It calls them to rally around that. What does a banner do to a football team that comes on a, on a field? It calls them to rally around their, their flag, right? What does a flag do? During war, it calls a military to keep it and protect it, right? A banner is something that rallies people together towards a symbol and a purpose. Except for in this case, Jesus, King Jesus, the Christ child of the manger, now the warrior conquering king, he is the banner that draws all men unto himself. Isn't that great? 
that all the peoples of the earth, it says, right? He'll be a banner for all the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place will rest of rest will be glorious. Man, this is the Christ child that you want to be close to. This is the Christ child that you want to know at Christmas. This is what Romans 8 is saying where all of creation has been groaning together throughout all the history of the world to be delivered from the fall. How many of you love it when you get out and you get ready to go to church and run a little bit late, stick your key in the car and you crank it and it don't start? That's a good time. Or you got a flat, right? Praise God. It's like that commercial, that Geico commercial, person pouring coffee on themselves. Hey, hee, 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 hee. Slamming your hand in the door. Oh, that's great. No, we hate the fallen world. It's horrible. It's miserable. But under Jesus Christ's reign is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Everything will be made right. Now, if you keep reading down, you can do that at home. It says from Assyria to Lower Egypt to Upper Egypt, from the Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia to Hamath, to the islands of the sea. And it goes on and on and on. And it says he will gather all his exiles to Israel. And he will assemble his scattered people to Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Jesus will draw all men to himself. The difference will be, at that time, people don't get to choose, right? If you're against Jesus, your knee will be humbled, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At Christmas time, when we, we celebrate the Christ child, Jesus comes humbly, quietly, filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to love and bless and grace us. And he says, I love you. I want a relationship with you. I want to be part of a family with you. I want you to be part of my heavenly forever family. And I'll be your brother and the father will be our father. And I will be your king. And we will have everything right. And Jesus offers everything. It's the full feast. In fact, in the book of Revelations, it gives that same idea. And later on in the book of Isaiah, it gives that same idea of this heavenly feast of everything. Now, everything's a lot. I don't know about you at Christmas feast, but ham, steak, all the trimmings, turkey. I mean, when you talk about everything, it's like something out of Narnia. You know, you just got everything on there. And maybe, maybe the wolf will sit there and eat with us, right? Everything will be right. And everyone on earth will know the Lord, for the land will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. He is the rallying point. He is the center. Revelation chapter 22 says, I think it's 22, it says, He is the light. There will be no sun, there will be no moon, because Jesus will be the light. Remember we talked about Jesus being the light last week? We talked about the character of Christ at Christmas out of Isaiah 9. He is the light. No mag lights required. No LEDs, because He's the man. Everybody will love being with Him. When you read the story of Jesus in the Gospels. All the time, people are attracted to him. Children are attracted to him. Women are attracted to him. Men are attracted to him. From all walks of life, everybody can relate to Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus because Jesus loves everybody. You think somebody in your life doesn't have time for you? Jesus has time for you. You think somebody in your life doesn't care for you? Jesus cares for you. And then it says at the end here, in this last verse, right, it says, and his resting pit, and his resting place, right? And his resting place will be glorious. If you really study that phrase, resting place, in, in Ruth 1.9, it means her home. This idea of home, being home and being safe. In Psalms 23.2, it means the waters of resting having to do with Noah's ark, being safe from the flood. In Numbers 10.33, it has to do with the Ark of the Covenant resting on God's holy mountain in a place of safety and security. It is used in Deuteronomy and the Psalms 95 as a place of the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place of rest for God's people, a place where God's people are what? They're at home with Him. I envision myself personally living on a 50,000 foot mountain Surrounded by 50 dogs, jumping off the mountain after I climb it every day into the crystal sea without scuba gear, hanging out with whatever it is, creatures that are in there, and then going and hanging out with Jesus for a few hours. Now, that could be way off, but it sounds pretty good. 
And you think your loved ones won't matter? My wife will matter greatly to me. My children? Yeah, we're not giving and taking in marriage, but it doesn't mean that those relationships are not precious and important and valuable and special. If you don't think so, study the man who went to hell in the book of Luke, and he calls for Abraham to do what? Take water to his what? His brothers. So that they don't end up in a place like this. Go tell them. Put water on my tongue. Go tell them so that they don't end up in a place like this. He's still thinking about his family. I don't know what all that means, but I can tell you this. Our loved ones will be significant. I don't know how or in what way, but they'll be special. Nothing in the scripture says otherwise. Heaven, the new Eden, the new Jerusalem, the new earth, all of it will be right. His first coming was marked as a Christ child of humility because he loves us. But his second coming again on this earth will be marked not with humility, not with privation, but with power and might. And his love will be shown throughout the world as he's the banner of the rallying for all the nations. So this is what I want you to be thinking about a little bit as we close this time. This is Christmas Eve. We celebrate the manger tonight. We've got the Christmas Eve service at 6 p.m. What do you do? What do you do with the Christ child of Christmas? How do you relate to the Christ child born in the manger in Bethlehem? What is your relationship individually with him? That's the real question as we approach Christmas this year. It's wonderful to talk about Jesus. It's wonderful to celebrate his birth. It's wonderful to give presents like God gave the present and the gift of Jesus to us. And the Magi gave gifts to him. It's wonderful to do all those things. But wouldn't it be a loss if you did all those things, walk through this life, you even liked Jesus, you knew about Jesus, you talked about Jesus, but you never personally had a relationship with Jesus. You would miss out on the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus didn't just come to give us eternal life in the future. He said, I've come to give you life and give it to you to the full. John 10, 10. That means now. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you drink from me, not literally, but if you take from me, out of you will come these flowing waters of life. Jesus makes all the difference in the world today, right now. And he makes all the difference in your future for eternity. So the question we need to ask ourselves as we've walked through Isaiah, as we've looked at the birth of the Christ child, as we've looked at the character of the Christ child and his kingdom to come, and we'll look at that some more. As we look at these things and we know Jesus and where it's going, we not only know the beginning of the story and the middle, we know the end of the story too. So how do we relate to Jesus? This morning, I pray that you have a personal relationship a close, intimate relationship with Jesus. And what that looks like is this, that somewhere along the line, you believe what God says about you. You believe what he says about man, that we have a problem with him, that we're born into a broken, fallen world. Does anybody dispute that? I mean, if there's something you're not going to believe in the Bible, it can't be sin. Just turn on the news for Pete's sake. Our world is broken and wasted all around us. And Jesus says that sin causes that and that we need somebody to take care of that sin. The second part is he says, you and I can't do that. You know, as my father used to say, boy, you're a little bit too big for your britches, right? Jesus says we're a little too big for our britches in dealing with sin. It's something we can't handle. Our shoulders aren't big enough, right? But as we looked at Isaiah 9, 6 last week, we saw that the government will rest on what? On his shoulders. He's the squat king, as we talked about. He can bear the sins of the world. And he can bear your sins and mine. No matter what you bring to the table, Jesus has it. So you've got to agree with God about who you are in the world and that you have a sin problem and that you need Jesus Christ. And then finally, you just simply got to believe in your heart all those things and then cry out to God. Ask him to forgive you of your personal sins, the things that you've done and to make you right with God, and then trust him to do it. One of the last things he had on the cross was, it is finished. The debt is paid in full. He's done all the work. All we have to do is show up and say yes. Is that a pretty good deal? How'd you like to show up for a day of work and just get paid and sent home? 
That's a good deal. And Jesus offers that. He's done the work, but offers the pay of eternal life and abundant life now. Who wouldn't take part of that? But it does require you to do this. It does require you to submit your will to his. And anybody who tells you otherwise is lying to you. You got to say yes, Jesus. You got to say yes. I pray that if someone's here this morning and they've never said yes to Jesus, that today will be the day of salvation. That when it says that he'll bring salvation with him, that you'll experience that with the rest of us as part of this, this faith family. Come this morning, talk to me about how to know Jesus in a personal way. Maybe you're here this morning and you know Jesus, but you're not walking with him. You're not close to this God where the Spirit of the Lord rests upon him. Isn't it time to come back into the fold? Isn't it time, you didn't lose your salvation, but isn't it time that you walk close to God and experience his love and his goodness and his power in your life? Come here, that's what this altar's for, to talk to God and say, forgive me. I've done my own thing. Haven't we all done that? Haven't we all walked our way? Right? Each of us has gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The book of Romans 3. But the Lord has laid upon him, Jesus, what? The iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53. Come back to God. Talk to him. He forgives and he gives grace. There's nothing that he won't forgive. What did he say? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Whatever God's talking to you about, this Christmas Eve, your best Christmas Eve will be if you're right with God. Let's pray.